Okay, hello everyone. How are you? How is your Tuesday going? I hope that you're having a fabulous day. I am really excited about this opportunity to be in community with my Oliver Scholars family and so many other people um, in my network and my Facebook family. What's up, y'all? So um, without any further ado, let me just say that um, we started this Oliver Scholars CEO Salon series about a year ago as a way to kind of just be in conversation with experts um, who were doing work that we felt was really pertinent to the black and brown community in particular, um, but also to our partners and family in uh, the struggle for educational equi equity and social justice. So tonight's conversation is all about self-care and mental health in the time of COVID-19. And we have an absolutely fabulous panel of experts. I'm looking forward to moderating this conversation. And without further ado, let me uh, begin to introduce you to, to our first panelist. So our first guest is Purvis Taylor III. He's an award-winning life coach, speaker, and author with over 10 years of experience in the mental wellness space. He is also the co-founder of Alchemic Solutions, a program that teaches young men of color how to develop emotional intelligence. Purvis, thank you for joining us and welcome. I want to say hey to the people. What's, What's up, up, everybody? Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled that you said yes. Um, I'm thrilled that you asked me. <laughs> um, so next up, we have uh, a member of the Oliver Scholars family. Her name is Pia Raymond. She is actually an alum of this illustrious family. She is an activist, an author, professor, and native Brooklyn girl. What's up, Brooklyn? A licensed social worker and professor at NYU Silver School of Social Work. Pia has the opportunity to educate and empower emerging health professionals to change culture and erase stigma in our city. She's also an author. Pia, I'm so glad we connected and I'm glad to have you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. You wanna say what's up to the people? Thank you, glad to be here. Shout out to all my Groton alum as well. I'm Groton class of 96. Um, hope all is doing well. Great. And last but not least is Dr. Deidre Franklin. Um, who I have had the pleasure of working alongside for many years. Dr. Franklin's career has focused on inclusion, access, and the psychological well being of historically marginalized groups. She has been an advocate and thought leader in social impact and educational spaces with 18 years of experience in mental health wellness. She is also the chief program and equity officer at Oliver Scholars, helping us to get our situation right and all together. So Deidre, I'm so glad to have you uh, join this conversation as well. You wanna thank say you, shout Danielle. out to people? Hey people, thank you, Danielle. Deidre's like a ghost on social media, so I was <laughs> blasting this conversation to a lot of the young people whose lives um, she's had the opportunity to touch over the years to say, if y'all want to see her on Facebook, this is going to be the time to do it. So uh, Deidre, thank you for joining the conversation. So um, so I'm just going to speak for myself right now. Um, I'm having good days. I'm having bad days. I'm having days where you know the sheltering in place um, mandates make sense. And I have other days where I think I'm going to go crazy if I don't get out of the house. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to hear from each of the panelists, um, what do you think the impact of sheltering in place has been on members of the community um, and young people specifically? Because we know teens in particular are very social beings. Um, you know, a lot of my teenage years were just spent hanging out. Um, shout out to the Upper West Side, West 97th Street. Um, and so that, I, I, for me, I don't think the social media can replace the connectivity that happens with just being in physical space with your people. Um, so who wants to go first and just give us a sense of 
What do you think the impact of this moment is going to be on our young people and their families? Purvis. I can go first. Yeah. Um, I definitely think, you know, relationally, definitely it's impacted them. I think a lot of students are realizing the importance of relationship and being in community, right? I think that's been one of the major impacts, but I also think the sense of agency, right? Especially in New York City where kids are able to like roam and go to school on their own. They're able to hang out at the bodega afterwards. You know, having that sense of freedom and autonomy, I think that's affected them a lot because now it's kind of like, I think that they're feeling a little bit more restricted and confined. Um, and so I definitely think it's impacted them in, in, in that way. Great. Yeah, I can add to that. Um, you know, while grown folks are experiencing the anxiety and the fear and the depression, the young people are experiencing that as well. But then in addition to that, as Purvis was saying, um, this is the time for them to connect and explore. They really don't want to be up in the house with grown folks and their family and the little brother and the grandma and the auntie, because we know that that's how many of our households are um, made up. So for them, um, it's really a sense of loss. I know for me, my assumption was uh, they're on these devices all the time. So what's the issue? Um, but what I'm learning in interacting with a lot of our scholars is that a big part of their connection is the human connection. And that happens in school. It happens after school. It happens at games. It happens, you know, dance lessons or whatever the case may be. And they don't have that. And they're grieving now for the loss of school. They're also grieving for the loss of events, proms, graduations, stuff as simple as pajama day in April or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. So our, our young people are really having a hard time. And I think that we as adults really are not in tune with that um, because teenagers don't talk, you know, they stay quiet, they stay in their corners many times. So, you know, I'm here to say that if you do have a teenager in your house or even a middle schooler in your house, you gotta know that stuff is going on for them and, and you should be sensitive to that and, and talk to them. If, if they'll talk to you. Great. Pia? Additionally, yeah, additionally, because we're talking to our scholars and so many of them are boarding school students, the impact of now having to come back home when adjustment is in process. And for many, you know, it takes a while to get adjusted to the new environment of the boarding school, especially for the freshmen. Um, so it's, a, it's an extreme impact on them as well, being back home readjusting to rules that may or may not have been in place or just the differences. And there's so much developmental growth that happens for adolescents in general, but I think particularly for our borders, because they're being put in uh, much more mature settings with so many more expectations of their independence that are being honored by boarding school teachers, faculty, you know, headmasters and such, that sometimes parents don't necessarily see the same way because they're not experiencing that growth with them together. So I think for our parents out there, just really being mindful, especially of our boarding school students and how to support them in the process and recognizing that um, in, in our independent schools, there's so much support around mental health, um, around sexuality, around the developmental um, stage that our youth are in, that they really may not be getting at home. So just keep that in mind, you know, and engaging with them and trying to create an open space. Thank you. So what are the, you know, DJ, you mentioned that teens and middle schoolers don't talk and I would definitely um, echo that. I'm a recovering middle school teacher. Um, I taught sixth through eighth grade up in the Bronx and in, in Brooklyn. Uh, many years ago. So what are some of the signs um, that we as educators, youth development workers, and parents should be paying attention to, to know uh, when our young people are struggling? And also, how can we recognize the struggle within ourselves? Because I, I, I know that there are a lot of people who are balancing the whole home and school gig um, with, um, you know, their professional livelihoods, those of us who have been fortunate enough to be able to continue to work um, through this sheltering in place mandate. Yeah, I mean, you had two questions in there. Um, yeah. First, I'll, I'll talk to, you know, what to look for. I mean, it's the same as with um, grown folks, right? We wanna look for 
sleeping too much or sleeping not at all. And that gets tricky, right? Because those of us that know teenagers and have teenagers, I have one of them. I have two of them, actually. All they do is sleep, but you kind of know their pattern. So you're looking for that. You're looking for loss of, loss of appetite. You're looking for isolation within isolation, right? You want to make sure that they're still engaging, you know, even with their sort of teenage um, moods that can swing. Uh, but be mindful of the fact that they're watching you as well. And so while we are all going through our own changes of being in quarantine, experiencing and grieving um, family members and friends that may have passed away or are sick, they're watching us and they're watching how we cope with things. But be mindful that things are happening for them and keep a watchful eye. I think one other piece that's really important and um, this has been happening. Um, folks have been secretly cutting um, to manage their anxiety. So while we don't want you getting off this um, webinar and running and looking on arms and you know legs for cutting, uh, that's an extreme case, but we have had instances where young people in an effort to manage their anxiety and their sadness began cutting. Mm -hmm. Purvis, you know, um, you you do a lot of work in terms of young boys of color um, and mental health. What are some of the signs um, that we should be paying attention attention to um, with our boys who may be less expressive? Um, Dr. Franklin hit on a lot of the things that I was going to say. Um, the mood swings um, that, like she said, the isolation within isolation. Uh, you know, my thing is always getting young boys to talk like being more verbal. So if they just don't have anything to say, like that's a that's a key indicator, like not anything, not saying anything at all. Um, you know, around the question that you asked about ourselves as, as adults, because they're watching us, I, you know, I, I, I always say, take the time to check in with you, make it a conscious effort every day to check in with you, to see where you are, being honest about where you are, being transparent about where you are. And I think, Creating environments where you're transparent about what you're experiencing, what you're going through, creates an environment for the children or the young people to be able to express where they are. And, you know, I always encourage parents to be transparent and vulnerable about the spaces that you're operating in, obviously being judicious and discerning about what it is that you do share, but making it safe for your teenagers to share um, and checking in with yourself and being honest with yourself. Uh, but yeah, Dr. Franklin hit, hit the nail on the head with the, you know, sleeping patterns, not sleeping. Um, but really just the, the the mood swings and isolation within isolation and, and, and the nonverbal communication. Pia, did you wanna uh, add anything to that? You're on mute. All excellent points. Um, just in addition, there's so much screen time going on for all of us, just the way we're engaging right now. So in any way that um, with the scholars out there just connecting with parents a little bit, if you can handle it about what you're watching, you know, what video games you're immersed in and um, just being mindful of the amount of time and what you're filling your space and your headspace with. I know for all of you, it's so important this journey that you're on educationally. So just keep in mind of what you're filling into your mind and your spirit and um, bathing. I think for everyone, because we're inside, there's not necessarily a reason to go out. We're just emerging from the cold weather. So it's easy to slip into that pajama routine, but when we think about mental health and how we usually will monitor you know, someone's status in terms of their mental health, we're looking at bathing, cleanliness, how are we grooming ourselves, our hair, our nails, and all the things that we might usually value on a day-to-day -day when we're going out. So you know, paying attention to our scholars um, and finding the balance in you know, lounging in the house, but still taking care of yourself, especially with all our salons and barbershops not being available, um, how are we really finding space, parents and you together, taking care of ourselves and our bodies? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point, yeah. Yeah, I wanna add on to that. Routine is so important. And um, yes. I think for many of us, you think, oh, I'm working from home. So as you were saying, Pia, you know, I'll roll out the bed and have half pajamas on and a blazer on and I'm good, you know, just like me right now. But um, when you really implement routine, both for yourself and for your children, it is so very helpful. 
Um, someone even told me, you should leave the house, walk to the corner and come back in the morning before going to work or school. Ooh. And then once you finish, leave the house, walk back to the corner. So it gives you that sort of sense of closure because I know that many of the students have talked about just as we know and understand that it feels like the day is never ending. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep going and going and going and going. And the young people, mm -hmm. yes, they feel the same as well. And so if we just try to shut down and go walk down the street, if you feel comfortable walking down the street, then, you know, that's, that's, that can be helpful. I haven't tried it yet, but you know, mm -hmm. I think I will. Yeah, I think I'm gonna add that to my repertoire. Um, so, what are some of the long-term risks on mental health of this really strange uh, moment in, in our country's history? I was talking to someone um, who has a school-age son, and um, while I've heard folks having a tough time explaining to their teenagers why they can't go out, um, her young son is afraid to go out. Um, and really um, had to be coaxed to even take a walk around the block. Um, that was something that I hadn't even been thinking about. So, you know, what are some of the long-term uh, effects that we need to prepare ourselves um, as we like slowly begin to reintegrate into normal, whatever normal looks like going forward? Anybody want to jump in? I'll jump in. Um, there's just a lot, a lot of talk in the field right now about mental health right now and in the coming months related to COVID. Um, so many of us have anxiety, depression, still grieving. Um, and so it's really thinking about down the road how do we wrap our arms around folks who are really struggling with this? How do we reestablish what we call social trust? Because many people are walking down the streets now and with this six feet apart, you know, one of these numbers, you know, it used to be, you know, and there's no shame in my game because I'm about racial justice. When a black man walks past you, sometimes you're like this just because society tells us, right? We're supposed to be afraid of black men. But now it's, I'm afraid of everybody. So there's this sense of fear and we've got to begin to heal and um, begin to incorporate healing circles. You know, we are a people that are about community. You know, we're not really individual you know, folks historically. So as a community, when we can come together, you know, we need to begin to look at healing circles around social trust. That's going to be a big piece of it. But there's this whole other side of it that we're going to deal with related to trauma, you know, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We once used to look at that related to veterans, but there's going to be a lot of PTSD related to COVID moving forward. Purvis, if you could speak to that a little bit, um, you know, some of my friends on Facebook were joking, not joking about, you know, a real fear in having men of color, particularly black and brown men, wear masks in public um, mm -hmm. and how that could potentially impact their physical um, safety in, in some communities and neighborhoods. Um, so do you want to talk yeah, a little bit about long term mental health, but also like you know, what does this mean within a, a racial context? Yeah, I mean, it's layered. The trauma is layered because, you know, these black black and brown boys are human beings first, right? And so they're dealing with just being a human being and trying to navigate through the space of COVID, then add on the layer of the racial lens added to it. And so it's more difficult for persons of color, particularly young men of color, to navigate through these spaces because they they're just trying to get to the humanity of who they are and also function and thrive in a world where they're, you know, that's their right. They should be able to thrive in this world. And so I think that that having that lens on it 
lens added to it, the racial injustice part added onto it, it makes it more complicated. It makes the grief more complicated, what is known as complicated grief, because now it's so compounded and so layered. It's like, how do we even get to that space of getting into the space of just finding uh, a balance with it, right? Tapping into the humanity of who they are and also honoring that space, but also honoring the fact that they do, we do live in a world that is, racial injustice is, is rampant. And how do we navigate through that space? So it's layered. So it's like we gotta we gotta take it layer by layer with them. And I think that's it's not fair. Um, but you know, that's that's how it is at this at this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that I think this unresolved grief is going to be and it continues, it is right now and will consistently um, in the future be something that we're all going to be struggle with, struggling with. Um, many of us have lost loved ones or extended um, community members and network members, uh, actual life. And in addition, there are so many social experiences um, for our scholars, school, like you mentioned, prom, all the events that we look forward to and community with others at this point is lost. So that it's an overarching grief that we're feeling and exhaustion that contributes to the stress level even though we're not out and about and commuting and running back and forth, that, that tired spirit and that fatigue is still there. Um, and particularly for our scholars, as we're looking at the long-term, it's using this time to really get more in touch with yourselves. This is the time that you're developing the most, your personality, your identity, what you believe in, your ideologies. Um, and so much of that happens through the school environment, but I think especially parents as well, using this time to really dig in and reflect on yourself and what your values are and what you look forward to doing in, in the growth period that is inevitable to come. Um, because with all of this social media and this virtual connectivity that we have, that gives a lot of room to not be real either. Just like we mentioned, you know, having sweatpants on and half dressed and not going outside. So people can really put forth a facade that's not real. And it's so important for all of us to get in touch with the real person on the inside. So when we come out from this layer, we're prepared to grow and we're ready to grow and we're confident whether we're virtual connecting or in real life that we're putting our best selves forward. Pia, you touched on something um, that I hadn't mentioned and that's the reality that a number of our scholars, um, staff, um, friends have actually experienced real loss. Mm -hmm. um, we know that this um, pandemic has disproportionately affected black and brown communities. And I know for me, in some of my nonprofit circles, we've been almost so focused on like trying to pivot all of our strategies um, that, you know, it took a while for us to process, yo, people are like really losing people that they love in the midst of everything that we're doing to make sure that our, our scholars have continuity of education, um, continuity of connection to all of our scholars. Um, and, uh, you know, I have attended um, my first online funeral. Um, and so I know personally um, the difficulty of like not being able to draw people in and, and hug people and touch people during a real moment of trauma and grief. Um, so d does anybody wanna kind of talk a little bit about how we help young people and staff really and, and adults to process grief in the absence of all of the rituals and traditions that we would normally rely on to help us get through the initial stages of what it means to lose someone? That's um, always oh, sorry. Oh. Now, say, that's one of the things about crisis um, that it brings us into a space of being creative and figuring out new strategies and new approaches on how we can communicate in this particular setting. Um, most of us it finds in, in communication. So with all the grief, it's we have to address it if it's something that's really hit our homes directly um, and really talk to our, especially our young people, give them the space, a safe space to at least share about it and how they feel. And if it's a matter of coming up with a new strategy or tradition that works for you and your family, if that is creating some sort of, even if it's a virtual photo album or a playlist or, or whatever it is that speaks to you, um, but not to ignore it. Because right now we are losing people every day 
And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, we don't get closure to even be able to see, visually lay eyes on that loved one. We just, you know, get a message that there aren't funerals in a lot of cases. And I mean, it's, it's a real heaviness that um, will continue throughout the generation. So it's up to us to really think about how do we give that um, healing space to one another when we may not be able to physically touch, but create other ways that we can share. Yes, please. Uh, to add on what Pia just eloquently stated, um, one of the things I've been sharing with people is that, you know, as human beings, we have the capacity to honor several spaces at one time. And so to add on to what she's talking about creativity wise, creating a virtual uh, photo album, right? That's honoring the joy that you have that person, but also not denying that you feel pain that this person is no longer here. So the way that we've grieved has has alt has been altered due to COVID, right? So we can't have the actual tactile experience where we hug and, and support one another during the time of uh, you know, during that bonding time of, of funerals can can have. And so now we've we've been we've our capacity has been stretched. And so now we have to honor this while honoring this at the same time. And I think that that helps it easier where you don't have to make a choice you can honor it all at the same time so like hold the spaces that are warm for you that you have for this person that's lost but also cry when you feel the need to cry and so like it's really just managing and being creative as pia said about how you're going to deal with the grief process because our you know our brains the plasticity of our brains have been changed the way we grieve is not the way we normally grieve and so now we have to adjust to this new normal for however long we're in this space so my suggestion has been to honor those multiple spaces at the same time teacher did you want to add anything so I was just going to add that, you know, one thing that I've learned in this time of quarantine is that creative expression is really important. And I think even around grief, you know, there are a multitude of ways that people grieve. But I think um, what many people don't hold on to is that we generally, as people of color, um, especially Black, Latinx, Native American folks, you know, we sort of rally around the drums and we rally around the music. Um, Music is cathartic uh, for many of us. You know, it, it soothes the beast, as they say. You know, when we go to funerals, you know, we we cry when we hear, you know, the songs, Amazing Grace. Um, so creative expression is, in, is important. And during these times, you can draw how you feel. You can write poetry, you know, to express how you feel. You can do an interpretive dance. Um, I'm a former dancer and dances can really express your emotions, even if it's in your kitchen. I've been doing a lot of little kitchen fake me out TikTok situations with my daughter, but it is, you know, um, a way to sort of express your grief and to cope with uh, a lot of the stuff that's happening now. I guess that would uh, explain, in, at least in part, why D Nice's Club Quarantine has taken off, uh, you know, next level stuff. Um, so um, I wanna talk a little bit about self care. Um, I'm gonna be honest, when I first heard this term, I was like, black people and black women in particular don't do none of that, you know. My paternal grandmother, I'm gonna give you a, a sense of what her schedule was, um, grow, grew up in poverty in Washington, D.C. Um, saw a house in her community in Northwest that she really wanted, um, started saving her money. And basically to pay off that house, she had three jobs. Um, she worked at a cleaners um, for the first part of the day. Then she went to clean white folks' houses um, in the late afternoon, early evening. And then she went to clean the school, the public school on her street um, at the end of the night. Um, maybe she got four hours of sleep um, for many years. Um, and, you know, me, myself, when I was, um, you know, trying to hustle through those graduate uh, degrees, you know, I had a full-time job always during grad school. I carried a full student load of classes. Um, and, you know, I just didn't have the opportunity or the luxury to say, oh, I'm going to take off a year. Um, to finish my dissertation. So um, that really wasn't, self-care wasn't really a part of the lexicon. Um, and now um, I'm, it just warms my heart to see how intentional um, young folks are about 
naming uh, the need for that space and um, figuring, you know, figuring out what they require, what their bodies require. Um, I saw a thread one time on uh, Twitter, like, who's rubbing Ella Baker's feet at night, right? <laughs> you know, who's taking care of us? So can you help educate the people around what the heck is self-care? Um, why is it important? And what does it look like? Hey, Purvis. Hey, anybody want to go before me? Y'all good? Okay, cool. Um, I always say that self-care is a merging of self-love and self-like. And what I mean, you know, obviously self-love, you know, taking care of yourself, brushing your teeth, bathing. But, you know, when you like somebody, you know, you have a crush on somebody, you do a little bit more for them. I feel like self-care is the merging of self-love and self-like, where it's like doing those things, those little bitty things that make you feel good about you and taking care of you. Those things that you know are a part of your arsenal, your toolbox to make sure that you are op operating at optimal levels, right? So that's what I think of as self-care. Um, it's important, and going back to what you were saying, uh, Danielle, you know, like our grandparents, my grandmother worked several jobs, it, you know, to save them to buy her house, right? But I think their brains, right, their mind was set up for survival and making ends meet. Whereas today, children's minds, the plasticity of their brains is like, I have possibilities. I can be an executive, an ice skater. I can be a baker. I can be all these multiple things at one time. So we have that freedom. And so now they can't suppress the way our grandparents could. So now they have to think of and do these things that they know are going to make them feel good and make sure that they operate at optimal levels. So that is the importance of why self-care is so vital and necessary in today's times. And so it's very, very necessary. And if you know if the kids know what they need to make them feel good, then by all means encourage that. As as long as it's it's healthy and it and it you know leads in the right direction, but self care is definitely vital and necessary for not only just our young people but for ourselves. I definitely have to make sure that I do a TikTok video or watch SpongeBob, do something that makes me feel like Purvis, something that makes sure that I'm operating at an optimal level. That has to be a part of my wellness toolbox. Yeah, I want to add to that um, something that I had to learn and. Um, those friends of mine who are watching, please keep your mouth shut around me and self-care. <laughs> I'm not really good at it. However, what I learned is you can be a working parent, you could be a mother, and you could still take five minutes to do something for yourself. And I think, you know, this quarantine situation has showed me that I have to do that. I mean, literally, it could be um, getting up early with that cup of coffee to watch the news before everybody else gets up. You know, it's not just two hours at a spa, which is what I imagined, or, you know, five hours at the salon to get your hair done, your nails did, and your toes did. You know, I used to think of it as being, you know, just so huge. That's but so I'm learning. Right? It, it, I mean, that's important too, right? <laughs> but it literally can be five or 10 minutes, you know, of just, getting your mind back, back into, you know, some sort of central space so that you could keep it moving. And it can be sound bites. It could be 10 minutes here. It could be five minutes here. It could be four minutes there. I know for, for most people that know me, they know that I laugh and they, and I joke and I do that a lot with my children, you know, um, to the point where one day we were joking and, and, attacking my son and like he threw me off the bed and I'm screaming and I'm I'm not a young chickadee but I'm saying all that to say that in that moment that was self-care for me like laughing and playing around with my kids that was self-care and I didn't really realize that previously so take those little sound bites and once you add the sound bites up you'll be okay and I think it's important too to give ourselves permission in that because um, you're being so transparent about your grandmother, Danielle, because we, a lot of us have seen that as the model in our homes and our families, the person that works so hard, the three jobs to buy the home. And so we don't give ourselves permission for the self-care. We feel like that's not what we're supposed to do, or we're not honoring the rest of the family, or we're being lazy, or we even tell each other that sometimes. So I think especially as people of African descent, we have to be very mindful of our language and what we give ourselves permission to do, and that 
thankfully, as Purvis mentioned, we have moved forward in some ways um, from that time. And so we have to honor that and knowing in particular that our physical health shows that it's dramatically affected by the level of stress that we have just by being people of African descent, people of Latino heritage, um, and that it affects our, our physical health with the diseases that we often display. So we have to be mindful of how we're eating, that we're eating healthy foods, that we're drinking water, with all of the media that's out right now and sharing about COVID, that we're mindful of not watching those messages as soon as we get up or as soon as we go to bed and carving out that time. And most of you, I'm assuming watching are parents of scholars. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. So now being in a space 24 seven is overwhelming. So carving out that time, if you have to lock yourself in the bathroom, whatever it takes, but take some of that time for yourself and demand it. Mm -hmm. Demand it of yourself and of everyone in your space. How do you, how do you teach your kids something different around self-care, you know, you all mentioned the fact that our parents and our grandparents did not come from generations where um, you felt like you had permission, um, you know, to really um, take time for yourself like that. That always, there was that tension between like, am I being selfish if I need this hour and I don't just, and it's not productive, right? You, that, that push for productivity is another um, conversation that, that's come up because initially, you know, I, I I know that for me, I was like, oh, good. I got back the three hours I would have spent commuting and like, I'm gonna use that time to like write my book and change the universe. And then I was like, you know, dang, why am I tired, right? And so how do we begin to teach our kids um, something different? What, is, what does self-care look like for a 13 year old or a 15 year old? Well, first I'll say, everybody has to know that kids are watching you all the time. And so we're teaching them without saying a word. So they are video cameras, as I would always say about my daughter. Um, that's the first thing that you have to know. So if they see that you're not doing anything for yourself, um, they're learning from that. The other piece of it is even before COVID, COVID most of the kids these days are so um, overwhelmed with school and everything else that they're doing and just society in general. Um, you know, you hear kids running around. Um, they want to talk about gender issues. They want to talk about climate change like they're taking on the world, which is a wonderful thing. But it's also really complicated because it really beats down, you know, who you are many times. Um, and so for my kids, similar to me, I'll say, you know, do what makes you happy, even in the moment. And as much as I'm not into the whole screen time forever, if TikTok makes them laugh and makes my daughter want to dance, go for it. If gaming means that my son is now engaged with friends that he's not seeing, friends that are in different states, go for it. Because I know and understand that that's going to do something for them. So it's really finding out for them, for them to do that, you know, uh, soul searching. What actually makes me happy? And hopefully it's not eating a whole pack of Oreo cookies because that's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to add on what Dr. Franklin just said, um, you know, you always want to appeal to that sense of agency within them because this is that part that that age group where they are literally looking for agency in, in such great amounts. And so you want to appeal to that, what she said, like, Discover that self-discovery, that 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 journey of self-discovery. What makes you happy? What makes you feel good? What are those things that that make you smile? If it is watching TikTok videos, if it is, you know, looking at YouTube, all right, so be it. But we just do it in moderation. We don't let you just run the gamut like we watch it the whole day, but you know, just in moderation, taking those spurts. And then, and obviously you modeling that for your children. Um, like I did just said, like, you know, they watch everything that we do. So you know, showing self-kindness towards yourself, you know, being graceful towards yourself, they too will, will learn to be that way as well. So like they will make the time, if they see you make the time to make yourself, to check in with yourself to feel better, they will do the same. So echoing what Dr. Franklin said. Did you want to add anything, Pia? Um, I just wanted to touch on the accountability because Dr. Franklin, you mentioned that your friends might not see the same. I'm transparent the same way. So it's having those accountability partners, whoever they are, your loved ones, who will make sure that you're taking that time for yourself or at least remind you to do so. 
so that it's not the bag of Oreos. So I know that feeling too. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's wait, see. Danielle, I want to say one, one more thing when um, she made me think about it around the accountability partners. Um, one thing I encourage everybody to do is to have that psychological emergency contact. That's what I call it. Psychological emergency contact. Who do you call when you feel in crisis? And it doesn't mean extreme crisis, but who do you call to talk about whatever you're feeling? Because whether we are in COVID or just day to day, you need that psychological emergency contact. And when you do not have it and you just sort of stay in your own space and time, that becomes problematic. So I really encourage everybody to think about that. You can have one, you could have two, you could have three, but you can't have zero. So mm -hmm. ask yourself, who is my psychological emergency contact? Just wanted to add to accountability um, accountability partner. I love that. Um, so we're starting to get questions from the audience. Um, so I'm gonna ask a couple. Someone asked, you know, I'm a single parent, how does, finding the time for self-care work for single parents. Um, my mother was a single mom and, you know, I had a slew of aunties um, and we kind of rotated houses. And what I learned uh, probably when I got to college is that some of my cousins weren't really cousins. <laughs> you know, we were so integrated into each other's lives. That's how our communities operate. You know, one day somebody says, well, how exactly are we related? And our parents were like, no, we grew up together. We're not related at all. Um, so that was definitely her strategy for like giving each other a break. I'll take the kids one weekend and so on and so forth. Um, how can parents um, these days, I never felt like I had those go-to friends who had um, you know, kids who were in the same age group as my daughter that I could just kind of like drop her off at. Also, I think parents are a little more cautious um, in this day and age about like, can I spend the night at so-and-so's house? No, I don't know them, you know, that kind of thing. So how do we balance that? That's certainly a concern, um, the safety. And right now, the challenge is that we are all at home and those, uh, if we had that type of network or support system, we're not able to draw on it quite the same way. So the gaming, I see as mentioned, the um, screen time is something obviously we want to be mindful of, but that is strategically sometimes how we might be able to garner that time for ourselves. Be cautious, you know, and maybe monitor, all right, for this 20 minutes or 30 minutes, um, the kids are on a specific reading program or something that you feel is worth the time that you will feel comfortable with and utilize that time and be clear that that will be your time. So if the kids have devices that they're using, and you feel comfortable with a particular program they're on, or maybe that's the 30 minutes that you say what it's going to be, and then utilize that time for your self-care. Something I've also done, because I mentioned I have two younger ones, is the same friends, sort of faux aunties um, that we would usually do play dates with. We're doing FaceTime or some sort of video chats where the kids get to interact with each other. I know most of you probably have adolescents, so that's even easier to give time this a lot of again when it makes sense for you, for them to talk. So now you have that time away that you can pause and relax because you know that they're in, if it's younger children, they're in somewhat of a supervised call, maybe with those same support network folks. And if it's adolescents that you know they're chatting with their friends in particular that, you know, give them a sense of belonging and connectivity while you take that as downtime for yourself. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, <clears throat> as a single parent, you're trying to balance between when they're occupied. Do I go and wash the clothes? You know, do I do I do what I need to do, the, the responsible stuff? Um, or do I take time for myself? 99.9% .9 of the time, you're running around doing what you need to do for the house. But this is that moment where you have to stop and say, you know what, I do need to take that time for myself. Dirty clothes are going to be dirty clothes. Dirty tubs going to be dirty dirty tubs. Unless the dirty clothes and the dirty tubs brings you extreme anxiety, I would say pause for a minute and take that time for yourself. Go back to that five minute moment that I was talking about. If your child is, you know, um, playing a game with auntie on on Zoom or whatever, but you really have to be intentional. I think when we just kind of go 
um, go with the flow and go what we're used to, we don't do that. So you really have to stop and think. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess we have a question going back to this issue of grief. You know, um, we did hear of some cases and instances of, of children passing away. Um, and, you know, the interruption of a young life, of possibility, of a future, I think, sometimes hits a little bit differently um, than it does when there is someone who's a little bit more seasoned, um, even though grief is grief. So um, does anybody want to talk about, like, how do you have that conversation with your kids? You know, the other thing that I had to acknowledge is that while we're all watching CNN 24-7 and MSNBC, our kids are like taking in bits and pieces of what they're hearing on television as well. So, um, you know, if you have a young person in your house or even if you as an adult have lost a child, um, you know, what are some of the strategies to deal with grief and also just this whole community grief that's blanketed um, our city and our community? I can go. Um, well, there's two pieces, right? When when you lose a child, and I say child, it's it can be um, an extremely traumatic situation. And I think many times we as as grown people stay in that sadness, and it's okay to be in that sadness. Um, but I do think that it's important that we celebrate. Um, celebrate those times that you had with your child. Remember those moments, those small moments that sometimes we actually take for granted. Um, and for those of us who believe in a higher power, you know, you have to understand that they're going to be okay. It doesn't make it easy. It doesn't mean that this is going to happen after a month, two months, sometimes even a year. Um, you ebb and flow but it's important to mix that feeling of loss and grief with celebration as well. Um, many times we just like to stay in that sort of negative space and we've got to find the light to pull ourselves out of it and, and, and celebrate. Um, those that, um, if you have other children, celebrate the other children around you and continuously uplift that child who um, is no longer physically with you. Um, just to add on to what Dr. Franklin said, you have to give yourself permission to, to get to a better place within that, right? You have to know that that's possible for you. The grief, obviously you will always grieve that child for the rest of your life, but how you grieve changes over time. Um, I lost my father to a heroin overdose and, and obviously he's an adult, but still a loss the way i grieve him is completely different than it was 15 years ago and you have to know but you have to know that there is another side to it so you have to give yourself permission and like i was saying earlier you know uh, you know honoring those spaces like did you just said you have to mix it the sadness with the joy the warm places that you have with that child and that's the way that you kind of get over that hump and and it, again there's no time limit to that and, and you shouldn't hold yourself to that you should allow that process to have its way, but give yourself permission to know that there is life after this. And if you have other children, as she said, celebrate those and find gratitude within the space that you're in right now, that you have love around you, that you that people wanna see you be well. Find the space for gratitude, even in the midst of, of grief, because it, you know, it always could be worse. It could always, always be worse. So find those spaces, those pockets of gratitude, those pockets of celebration along the journey. And it helps you get to a better end. And if there's an opportunity to honor that life in some way that would be meaningful to you and the family, that you do that, but never losing sight of that your life has been sustained. Um, and as difficult as it may be, not having guilt around that, but having gratefulness and how your life will move forward. And if you have other children and other family members, how you'll do that together. So opening that dialogue with one another um, and just understanding that we sit with the grief, that's okay. That's how we can heal in the, in the long run, but we wanna make sure that we're on a path toward healing and growing.
Your mic is off. So we talked a little bit about this pressure that many of us felt um, on the front end of this pandemic to be hyper productive um, and the anxiety that that produces. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to find balance and not feel like you're wasting time when you're not constantly um, on, on, that, on that wheel? Um, and the role of anxiety and kind of like how we're managing um, this moment. You know, I, I just want to say that 30 years ago, like I didn't know what anxiety was. Um, and, and I think it's like a normal part of a healthy mind, um, but we certainly weren't um, in, a, in a place where we named it. Um, so talk a little bit about anxiety and the role it plays in our lives now. We see it um, a lot in our young people, actually. Um, and, you know, I feel like 20, 30 years ago, nobody asked you about your mental health. So you just figured out a way to suck it up. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, I think uh, young people are much more, um, they, ha they have a lot more agency around how things are hitting them and the ability to name anxiety. Um, so how do we manage all of that? Well, we're all dealing with the stress of Corona. Um, in some cases, people are sick or thankfully possibly recovering at this point, or as we've talked a lot about the grief. So there is an added pressure in some cases for people to feel or be more productive at home if they're working from home, if they're engaging in remote learning. Um, but we have to be mindful that with the level of stress that we are experiencing, that we can't expect ourselves to be exactly the same. And I know part of being an Oliver Scholar is measuring yourself by excellence at all times, um, but we have to really be mindful of excellence looks different on different days, our best looks different on different days, and right now this is a world crisis. The entire world is experiencing this at the same time. So we have a responsibility to reduce some of that pressure on ourselves and gives ourselves permission again to be our best, whatever that looks like day to day, but making sure to take time for what we need and taking time off. Just like you mentioned the commute being three hours before when you were going back and forth to the office, then decide that at least a portion of that commute will be some time where you're not engaging in emails and whatever it is that you have to do to organize from home because you wouldn't have been doing that going back and forth to the office. And I think because we do have this time, especially as New Yorkers, we find ourselves wanting to cram it with more. Um, and especially as Oliver Scholars, just that the nature of our beings. Um, so we really have to, the same dedication that we apply to our work all the time, we have to really be mindful of applying it to ourselves. And I, think I agree. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I was good. I was, I'm going to be very brief. I agree with what Pia said. Um, I think we need, this is a time for us to exhibit a lot of self-grace towards ourselves and self-kindness towards ourselves. I think the culture, we live in a society that is all about productivity. You got to produce, you got to produce, you got to produce. Well, that's great, but we also have to rest and we also have to retreat within ourselves and spend time with ourselves to get to know who we are. I think this is a great time for people to discover who they are and who they are not. And so like, while we're on this quest of like productivity, you getting to know yourself and resting is productivity as well. So it's like, we have to rebrand ourselves with what we think productivity is. Uh, I think at this time of COVID, I think a lot of people are having, you know, anxiety is typically about future events that haven't happened yet. And um, we need to start having conversations and dialogue about it. Again, you know, I'm a proponent for being transparent. I believe that when a leader is transparent, you create an environment for sharing. So sharing, you know, parents being transparent about the anxiety that they may feel that may open up a space for them to have a dialogue with their children, letting them know that they're not in this by themselves and figuring out, you know, the more you talk about certain things, you know, the, the weight of it is kind of lifted. And so always letting them know that there's a space for you to talk about this, right? Because a lot of times it's a, it's this thing going on in our minds. And once we say it out loud and someone else hears it, it lessens the power of it. So I'm all about being transparent and sharing those vulnerable spaces within, within ourselves with each other. Yeah, I was going to talk about the sort of self-exploration that's really, really important. And, and I think in, in these times when we're stuck in the house, um, even though we're busy, it does provide an opportunity time to just kind of really think about, 
you know, who we are, what makes us tick, what makes us anxious, what kind of anxiety. You have anxiety that, you know, makes you go a thousand miles an hour. And then you have anxiety that's actually debilitating where you can't even move because you're so in your head worried. Um, I know a friend of mine who uh, dad is, is, has a seventh grade education from South Carolina. He used to call it worryation. He's like, I always got worryation. It's always happening. Um, and so you just have to be mindful of what's happening, right? Um, is it the thoughts in your head? You know, is it reality? Are there stories that you're constantly telling? Are you not present because you're just in your head? You know, what do you do to stop and begin to be in the here and now and not in, you know, your own space and time in your head? Are you keeping yourself so busy because you're anxious that you're wearing yourself out and you can't partake in self-care. I mean, anxiety is a is a big, big, big construct. Um, it goes from, as I said, zero to a hundred. But you know, I do think it's important to really learn who you are and be honest about who you are. And as Purvis said, um, there's never been any shame in my game. I talk to my kids about you know the things that I can't do. And I talk to them about the things that I can do. And I tell them the same. You're going to be able to do a whole lot of things. And baby, there's going to be a whole lot of things that you're not going to be able to do. But the first thing you need to do is be aware of the cans and the cannots. And then that way, you know, you walk through life with your eyes open and no one can trip you up as a result of it. So we are hitting on the end of our hour. Um, didn't that go by so quickly? <laughs> There's just like so much um, more left to explore. Can I ask if each of our esteemed panelists to just give me three takeaways that if folks get nothing else from this conversation, you want to make sure um, they heard these three things. Who wants to go first? Everybody's pondering. Hmm. I'm going to go back to that. Take five minutes, take 10 minutes. Um, forgive yourself. If you can't get everything yeah. done, forgive yourself. It's going to be all right. And I'm going to tell myself that too. Deidre, it's going to be all right. All right. Thank you, Deidre. <laughs> Those clinicians out there are like, um, she's the doctor. Um, and this is going to sound so crazy. Have fun. Laugh. Laugh, dance, be free. This is the time. There's not a lot of traffic out. Go out in the street, be free. Wear a mask, but be free. Those are my three things. Thank you. Purvis. My, my three things are, again, self-kindness, along with the forget self-forgiveness, self-grace, right? Though, that's very important. Be kind to you, especially during this time. Do not beat yourself up. Again, if you don't, meet your metric for the day, it's okay. It's going to be all right. The world is going to rotate. Um, so self-kindness, again, have fun. Dance around the house. Do some TikTok videos. Do do the Savage Challenge. Like, just have some fun. Do something, whatever makes you laugh. And, and the third thing is, again, the transparent thing. I, I truly believe in being transparent and honest and vulnerable about where you are. I think that's so important. I think so many of us wear a mask daily. And I think now's the time to remove the mask and be honest about where you are. And also know that you're not the only one that's going through that. You know, so like it's a whole community of people who are experiencing the exact same thing that you're experiencing. So be transparent and vulnerable. Um, Purvis, before you go, can you tell us the yes. name of your book and where we can get a copy? Oh, thank you, doctor. Um, my, name is, my book is called Survival Mode. It teaches young men of color how to process and navigate through their emotions and mental health. Um, it's available on Amazon.com and SirThrivalMode.com. Um, SirThrival is hybrid of surviving and thriving, taking them from surviving to thriving. You so fancy. Okay, yes. Kia. Um, and we all, but after you give us your three things, let us know where we can get your book as well in the title. You're on mute. <laughs> Being we're speaking with all of our scholars and their parents, I encourage that dialogue between you during this time, um, getting to know each other in this new space of adolescence, especially the borders, reconnect as to how you're growing. 
with your families, um, for all of us, adults and children alike, adolescents alike, exploring really who you are during this time. It's a unique opportunity to be at home or you know in one space most of the time, which may seem stressful in some ways, but it's a chance to really pause and reflect and get in touch with who your true self is and how you wanna grow as we emerge from this season. And then permission, especially for our scholars, permission, permission, permission for your best to look different on different days and to take that time to take care of yourselves and figure out what that is and make sure that you um, carve out that time for yourself, for our scholars and for our parents. It's so important. Thank you. And the oh, the book, <laughs> so a children's book called Celebrate Smiles. It's a tale about a young girl and her birthday surprise, which is really, again, get in touch with who she is and uh, that things are never more important than what's inside of you. And you can find Celebrate Smiles at Amazon.com and you can find it through my name, Pia Raymond at Amazon.com. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, to everyone who joined us, I wanna thank you for being a part of this conversation. Our next conversation, which will be advertised on our Facebook page, is gonna focus on the educational cost um, to our young people of this, the suspension of the school year and what parents can do to continue to set their kids up for academic success. I wanna thank you for joining the conversation. If you have topics you want Oliver Scholars to hit upon, please make sure you share them in the comments section. And shout out to Moshe Crone, who actually produced this entire um, conversation on Facebook Live. So, hey, Moshe, we appreciate you. We certainly could not do this without you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.